I would like to continue in what I was talking about, and we're looking at the theme for 2018. What's the theme for 2018? It is forward, forward in 2018. And we looked at a lot of the letters, and I'm, a little, I'm jumping up and down a little bit. I know that last week we looked at the W, and the W stands for we win when we win the lost at any cost. Amen. And, and, and so it's a privilege, it's an honor for us to be able to share Jesus as we go into our world. Today, I want to look at the R, F-O-R-W-A-R. That R, that R, the second R, the second R stands for you and and I being resilient and resolute. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word once again, I thank you that you and your word are one, that you said heaven and earth would pass away, but your word will never ever pass away. Now, I want to thank you that as the word comes, that you said faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I want to thank you this morning for a boldness. I want to thank you for a courage. I want to thank you for a resiliency. I want to thank you for a determination. I want to thank you for a tenacious spirit. My God, that even though we might be facing all kinds of things because of our resilient faith, that we refuse to give up. We refuse to back down. We refuse to quit. But in Jesus' name, we will continue on for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can you say praise the Lord? I believe that boldness and courage and having a resilient faith and being resolute are going to be the hallmarks that will define you and me for 2018. If you, if you believe that, say amen. Hallelujah. And so we're talking about a resilient faith, not just any kind of faith, but a resilient faith, which is a faith that will not give up, it'll not give in, it'll not give out, it'll not quit. It is a steadfast faith that is anchored in our God and in His Word, and it is a faith that allows you and I to continue in God. And it's a kind of faith that produces a kind of people that Jesus declares to be violent. If you have your Bible, Matthew 11 and 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers what? Violence. But the violent take it. By force. Who takes it by force? The violent. The violent. Do we have any violent people? I'm not talking about a violent temper or a violent anger or being violent in your kung fu. I'm talking about having a violent faith, that you are violent in your spirit man. In other words, there is the ability on the inside of you to rise up and not let go of every promise that God gives you. Then in Luke 16 and 16, this is what Jesus said. He said, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is what? Pressing into it. What is everyone doing? What is everyone doing? Notice that it doesn't say just a few select are doing it. Uh, you know, if you've been a, a Christian for 50 years, uh, those only those, it says everyone. How many people? Everyone. How many people? And what is everyone doing? They are pressing into that. That speaks about a resilient faith. That speaks about a violent people. Hallelujah. Anyone who desires it, anyone who is thirsty, anyone who has a holy dissatisfaction, anyone who wants more of God, God is saying that you can press into it. How? Because of a resilient faith. So a resilient faith is a violent faith. A resilient faith, if I may say it, is a forceful faith. It is a faith that presses in in spite of the circumstances or situation. A resilient faith is a faith that just simply refuses to let go of God and His promises. I want to ask you this morning a question. How resilient is your faith? This morning, if I had asked you, how violent and how forceful is your faith? 
You know that there's a lot of violence in the world today. And it is a violence that results in abuse and pain and sufferings and rape and murder and genocide and atrocities that are too horrific to even mention. I'm not talking about that kind of a violence. The violence that I'm talking about is a spiritual violence that comes through a spiritual reawakening. That's the reason why we've set time to pray and fast. There is no better way to rekindle the flame on the inside of you, the fire of God on the inside of you, like when we get to pray and abstain from some food. Hallelujah. That kind of praying and fasting will cause your faith to be reignited by the fire of the Holy Spirit. It'll put some hair on your teeth. It'll give you a bit of a backbone. It'll put some steel into your DNA and cause you and I to be warriors for Jesus. Is there anybody here that's a warrior for Jesus? You know, it's kind of like, it's, it's what I liked about the old Pentecostals. It's what I really loved and appreciated about our founder and apostle, Dr. Fred, uh, Dr. Fred Roberts. People like him were not afraid to pray. They weren't afraid to fast. And I know that maybe they might have been construed as being a little bit crazy and a little bit weird, but I liked the fire they had. Can you say Amen. We have a generation today, and I don't mean to be mean, but I want to just say something this morning. That we have a generation today that think that because they can Google everything, and they have read about it, that they know it. There are some things that only come to you that you know because of experience and because of the process of time. There are some things that you will come to know. I'm talking about a knowing on the inside of you that comes through prayer and fasting, spending time in His presence, hallelujah, and actually going through some things and then coming out of those things that you now know. I, I know some things, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you are in your 20s and 30s, and 30s, I want to tell you, you've still got to go through some stuff. I love you, and I'm with you, and I'm praying with you, but there are some things that you just don't know. Come on, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Going through some stuff and coming out of the other side, and when you come through the other side, those things become internalized on the inside of you that you didn't read it on Google, you didn't get to watch it on YouTube, YouTube, you didn't get to know about it through Instagram. It came as a result of you going through some things. If we're going to move forward in 2018, I do believe that we have to have a resilient faith. And the Bible is full of people who exemplified a resilient faith. If you look at Abraham who left the land of Ur of the Chaldeans and ventured into the unknown. And his resilient faith caused him to hold on even when he didn't even know where he was going. I think about Joseph who was hated by his brothers, sold into slavery and then taken to Egypt. And then in Egypt he gets thrown into prison and stays there for years. But not once did he give up. Instead, he stayed with God and allowed God to use him in that dreadful environment until God promoted him to be prime minister. You look at Paul in the New Testament, and he started his career by persecuting all believers. But then one day on that road to Damascus, he has a supernatural encounter with Jesus and his life is dramatically transformed so much so that he gets to pen three quarters of the New Testament. And he's the only one that has a, rev a revelation of the post-ascension ministry of Jesus. And then when you look at what he writes in 2 Corinthians 4 and 8, he says, you know what? We are hard pressed on every side. In other words, we're going through some things. He says, yet we're not crushed. We are perplexed. I mean, there are some things I cannot explain. There are some things that I do not know. He says, but we're not in despair. He says, we are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. That sounds like resilience to me. Resilience is measured in the face of adversity. If you want to know how resilient your faith is today, look at how you react to adversity.
It's easy to serve God when everybody is loving you and talking nicely about you. It's easy to serve God when you just got promoted and you've just signed that five million rand deal. It's easy to serve God when you come to church on a Sunday and everybody is smiling and shaking your hand. Praise the Lord. Praise God, brother. So good to see you. And they got this. It's easy to serve God when everybody has lifted their hands and worshiping God. But that's not how we measure resilience. True biblical resilience is measured in the crucible of adversity and affliction. In other words, when all hell has broken loose around you and your closest family and friends have left you high and dry, can you still praise God? It doesn't take a whole lot of faith to step out and do something great for God if you've got several millions sitting in the bank account. But when you've got nothing and God tells you to step out, are you still able to do so? And when everything goes pear shape and every door closes, do you have the resilience to stand up and continue with God? I looked up the word resilience and it means to be strong. It means to be tough. Look at, look at your neighbor and say, I'm tough. You're sitting next to a tough person. I'm a tough cookie. I, 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 yeah, I'm somebody tough. That word resilient means to be hardy. It means to be quick to recover. Come on. Some of you are still, still languishing about something that happened two, three, five, ten years ago. Get over it, man. Resilient faith says, you know what? That happened a long time ago. I am quick to recover. Resilient means you are buoyant. Resilience means you are irrepressible. In other words, you might be knocked down, but you don't stay down because you are irrepressible. Hallelujah. Life will knock you down. The enemy will try and knock you down. But what do you do? Stay down and cry and have a petty party and get all the balloons and the cake. I told you before, nobody will come to your petty party. But if you are knocked down, you can kick yourself back up again, dust yourself off, clean your knees and wipe your hands and clean your mouth and continue with God. You are irrepressible. Resilient means you have the ability to bounce back again. Hallelujah. Do we have any, anybody here that's bounced back from a divorce? Bounced back from losing everything? Bounced back from a disappointment? Bounced back from some atrocity that happened in your life? Hallelujah. Look at somebody and tell them, I, I bounced back. I'm here. I'm, I bounced back. I bounced back. Resilience is the ability to cope with stress and adversity and bounce back to a place where you can go in God and do what He's called you to do. Hallelujah. Praise God. Resilience is using the exposure of that adversity to produce a stealing effect on the inside of you and that you function better than expected. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Resilience means you're able to face all of life's difficulties with courage and boldness and patience, refusing to give up. Resilience is actually rooted in the spirit of tenacity. It means you have a tenacious spirit. There is a determination to embrace all that makes life worth living, even in the face of overwhelming odds. If you have a clear sense of identity and purpose, you are resilient because you hold fast to your vision. And I thank God that we have vision in this place. And because of vision, we have identity, we have purpose, we have meaning to what we do. And because of that, we have resilient faith. Somebody once said, every great personal story you have to tell involves overcoming adversity. If you shy away from adversity, you will take away your ability to tell new stories. I look forward to that day when we open the new dome. We'll have a story to tell because we came through some adversities. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm coming back. Hallelujah. I like what Paul says in Ephesians 6 and 10. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Hallelujah. And then he goes on to say, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. 
Praise God. Hallelujah. The Amplified, the Amplified Version says, in conclusion, be strong in the Lord. Be empowered, how? Through your union with Him. Be empowered, how? Through your union with Him. Draw your strength from Him, that strength which His boundless might provides. Hallelujah. So according to verse 10 in the Amplified, you are only as strong as your union with Him is. If your union with God is strong, you will be strong. Which means you'll be able to face adversity. You'll be able to face difficulty. You'll be able to face hardships. Why? Because my union with God is strong. Therefore, because of that union, I am able to draw His strength. I am able to draw His fortitude. I am able to draw His might, His ability. And then it says, now once you've done that and you've got your union with God good, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. Not just any armor. It's got to be the right armor. And then he said, I don't want you just to have the shoe on and, or just the helmet. A lot of us, we, we're partly clad. Being partly clad is not going to work for you. Having one foot in and one foot out is not going to work for you. Can I get an amen in this place? He says, if you're going to face adversity and have a resilient faith, if you're going to be able to overcome every obstacle that the enemy puts in your path, you're going to put, have to put on the whole armor of God. God, hallelujah. And then he says, he gives us a clue. He says, now your fight is not against flesh and blood. You cannot fight what you do not understand. Can I say that one more time? You cannot fight what you do not understand. A lot of the time we spend a lot of energy and a lot of stress and a lot of emotions on things that are not even the real issue. Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. And then in Mark 4 and 15, he says, it's Satan that comes to take away the word. In Matthew 22 and 3, we read that it was Satan's influence that led Judas to betray Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 12 and 7, Paul says, a messenger of Satan was tormenting me. In Matthew 4 and 1, Matthew says that Satan tried to tempt Jesus when he was in the wilderness. If you look at the parable of the sower, Jesus illustrates how Satan sows confusion and misunderstanding in the hearts of those who after hearing the scripture are not able to understand the word and to put it into action. And so the devil comes, the enemy comes and snatches the word right back out of their hearts. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 11 and 3 and says, Satan is a deceiver. Just as he deceived Eve, so he comes to deceive you and I. And then Peter in 1 Peter 5 and 8 says that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. I want you to know that the Bible is clear about who our enemy is and who it is that we are fighting. And this enemy creates through adversity that comes our way. He snatches the word of faith from our hearts and replaces it with seeds of doubt and confusion. The devil is after your faith. But I want to encourage you today. Hallelujah. Maybe you were knocked down in 2017 and the enemy knocked you down, but you don't have to stay down. I want to tell you in Jesus' name to get back up again and to go for God. Whatever it is that you are facing, you are not alone. Every one of us is facing something. Every one of us has to contend with adversity, trials, hardships, temptations, on and on and on. Nobody said that life would be easy, and nobody said that serving Jesus would be easy as well. As a matter of fact, if I can get the guys to come right now, where my cross is and those things. But if you could just right now, and, and, and those boards, where are where those boards? I, I want those boards right now, those, those names. Come guys, quickly, quickly, quickly. Wayne, come and bring me those boards. Do we have those labels? Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. So what's the first one? The first one, 
Well, let me just, before I, go, I, I do this, let's look at Matthew 16 and 24. Matthew 16 and 24. This is what Jesus said. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What did he say? If anyone desires to come after me, if anyone wants to be my disciple, if anybody wants to be my follower, let him or her deny himself or herself and take up his cross and follow me. What does it mean to carry the cross? What does it mean? It means, what does it mean if I've got to, if I've got to take this cross and I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to carry this cross? Can I carry this cross? I'll try and carry this cross. It says, take up your cross and follow me. What does it mean? Thank you, guys. What does it mean to carry your cross? Is the cross that I carry different from the cross that you carry? But I want you to think about what Jesus, to answer this question, think about what Jesus accomplished on the cross. That's what our reap vision is actually all about. We are reaping everything Jesus accomplished for the glory of God. Would you say that after me? I'm reaping everything Jesus accomplished for the glory of God. That's our reap vision. Our vision. What's our vision? Reaping everything Jesus accomplished for the glory of God. Well, what was it that Jesus accomplished on the cross? Well, if I think about the cross, would you agree with me? Salvation comes to my mind. So we think about salvation. You can put the cross down and you can begin to nail that. If I think about the cross, uh, what about this word? Um, what about this word? Forgiveness. Is that a word? Is that, is that the cross? That's a, that's a word. That's a word. What about this word? What about this word? What about mercy? When you think about the cross, do you think about mercy? I think about mercy. When I think about the cross, do you think about this word? Does grace come from the cross? I, I think so. I think so. When I think about the cross, does this word pop up in your mind? Freedom. I'm free. Hallelujah. Through the cross. When I think about the cross, do you think there is this word? Do you think there is this word? Redemption. I've been redeemed. He's my kinsman redeemer. When I think about the cross, do I think about love? What about love? Love. I think, I think that's great. When I think about the cross, well, how about access to God? Access to God is because of the cross. When I think about the cross, what about this word? Righteousness. That's on the cross. When I think about the cross through the stripes of Jesus, I was. Healing is part of it. When I think about the cross, how about the, G, the blood of Jesus? I think about the blood of Jesus. When I think about the cross, do I, what about this word? Does it, does it give you hope? It gives me hope. When I think about the cross, what about this word? Does this word pop up? Faith. Faith comes because of the cross. When I think about the cross, do I think defeat or do I think triumph? Triumph. I think that would be a good word. When I think about the cross and when you think about the cross, how about this word? Yeah, yeah, you, would that be a good word? Put that, put on the cross. When I think about the cross, I think about heaven coming to earth. Would that be a good word? I think so. When I think about the cross, I don't know about you, but I think about death to self. Would that be a good word? I think that would be a good word. When I think about the cross, how about this word? Power. There's power in the cross. Man, I, I think that's good. When I think about the cross, how about this? I have authority because of what Jesus did on the cross. When I think about the cross, how about that being a weapon to come against all the enemies that you face? When you think about the cross, how many of you think about the defeat of death, hell, and the grave? That would be a good word. When I think about the cross, how about holiness? Is holiness a good word? I think holiness would be a good word. A good word, a good word. Holiness, holiness. How about this word? Intimacy with God. You think about the cross, you think about intimacy with God. How about this word? Family of God. When I think about the cross, I think about blue, black, white, blue, whatever color you are. All the family of God. When I think about the cross, I think about this word. How about this word? Huh? Covenant covenant because of the cross when I think about the cross how about this word unity because of the blood we are united when I think about the cross not only the family of God but I think about the body of Christ when I think about the cross I think about this word the church of the Lord Jesus Christ when I think about the cross I think who was it that was on the cross Jesus I think that would be good when I think about Jesus I think about the 
God man. Here's the God man. Hallelujah. When I think about the God man, I think about the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. When I think about the God man, I think about what he came to do. He came to atone, the atonement. I think about sacrifice. Hallelujah. I think about the cross. I think about abundance and prosperity. Would that be a good word? That would be a good word. When I think about the cross, I think about my wife and I think about joy. Hallelujah. Joy in the Holy Ghost. When I think about the cross, I think about a peace that you and I have, that He is the God of peace. Hallelujah. The God of peace. When I think about the cross, I think about all the gifts that He gave to us men and women. When I think about the cross, I think about the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. When I think about the cross, I think about compassion. It is the compassion of God we see. And when I think about the cross, I think about having a resilient faith. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. So now, so now, so now, when he says, pick up the cross, he says, if you want to follow me, deny yourself. What is that word? What does it mean to deny yourself? What does it mean to de- become as low as you can? The lowest of the scum, become a worm of the earth. Is that what it means? No. To deny yourself means to deny your failures, to deny your weaknesses, to deny your shortcomings, to deny your past, to deny the hurts, to deny all of that, the bitterness and the unforgiveness. And he says, I want you now to pick up the cross. Hallelujah. I want you to pick up the cross. And then I want you to go into your life, wherever you go. As you go shopping, you pick up the cross. Hallelujah. As you go to CrossFit, you pick up the cross. But you're not just picking up the cross. You're picking up and revealing everything that the cross says. Hallelujah. When you pick up the cross, what are you doing? You're showing. You're, you are manifesting everything. You're not car- carrying the cross. You're carrying everything that I'm carrying. You need. So when you look at adversity and you look at trial and you look at that hard place, you say adversity, I'm coming to you. I'm carrying the cross. I'm not filtering the gospel. I'm not diluting the gospel, but I'm carrying my cross. My cross doesn't make me morbid. It doesn't make me depressed. It doesn't make me sad. But when I carry the cross, I'm carrying victory. I'm carrying triumph. I'm carrying all that the cross has meant to carry. Can you say praise the Lord? Friends, I don't like to close the broadcast without giving you an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, you're either running God's race or you are not. And the moment you are born again, you qualify to run God's race. So today, perhaps as you are watching, you realize that your life is not right with God. Don't go another day, another moment, another hour, another second without putting right with God. The amazing thing is He is so loving and He loves you unconditionally. It's not based on what you can do or what you can say. His love for you never changes. But you know, as you've been watching, that there are things not right. And uh, right now is a good moment. Don't wait for tomorrow. Don't wait for next week. But right now is a divine moment. Heaven is open right now for you to respond to come to Christ. And I know that there are people right now watching that are ready to either recommit their lives to Christ or to come fresh, never having come to Christ before, you can do it right now. Would you bow your heads and say after me, Heavenly Father, I ask you for forgiveness. I repent of my sins. I turn my back right now. I renounce the devil and all of his works, but you, Lord Jesus, I invite into my life right now. I receive eternal life and the forgiveness of all of my sins. Thank you for your precious blood that cleanses me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for giving me another opportunity. And I come to you. I open every part of my life. And Jesus, with my heart I believe, And with my mouth, I confess 
that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'll never be the same from this day onwards forever. I belong to you and you belong to me in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Friend, I'm so glad that you've prayed that prayer. It's just a prayer of faith. It's a simple prayer. But I do believe that God heard the cry of your heart and that right now you're a child of God. And this is a time to celebrate. We'd like to celebrate this decision with you. So would you be so kind as to let us know what's happened in your life? Let us know if this is the first time you prayed this prayer or if you have any other prayer requests. Right now, the details are coming on your screen or you can even SMS us your prayer request as well. We do have that facility available and we're just so glad to be able to join our faith together with your faith and believe God for a miracle just for you. Well, that's about it. We've run out of time. Until next time, God bless you. And remember, Jesus loves you so very much and so do we. For more information about DCC, follow us on all our social media platforms. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, WhatsApp, and our website. We love doing life together with you here at Durban Christian Center, a house of prayer for all nations.